Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I am Adam Levy. And uh, as Ann said, I have uh, over 15 years of experience teaching um, science and mathematics. Um, and I hope you enjoy this open class. That's uh, for AP Physics 1. Let me just uh, get started here. All right. So if you um, if you have something to write with in front of you, that would be great to get. Um, and it's a piece of paper, something to make a couple of notes on. We're going to actually do a few problems here uh, during this course. OK, how to ace the AP Physics 1 test. Let's see, this test essentially only covers uh, mechanics, electricity, and waves. It is not a very expansive test. Um, and the majority of the test will be on the mechanic side with a sprinkling of electricity and waves here and there. So um, it's supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to cover the first semester of the, your college course. And uh, if you get a four or five, usually colleges will honor full credit for that college course. Structure of the test, you might be familiar with this already. Um, there are 50 questions of multiple choice questions. You get an hour and a half. That counts for half of the test, 50%. There is uh, five multiple or five free response questions. You get an hour and a half for that. And that also counts for 50% of the test. So in the free response section, this is the part that students find the hardest. You have one 12 point question posed in a laboratory setting. So they give you a laboratory situation and you have to um, actually set up a lab, explain how you would conduct the lab, what materials you might need and, and so on, and then um, give results for it. There's a 12 point qualitative quantitative translation, which is one where you have to write down the possibly the equations for it or something mathematical and then translate that into um, something that is in a paragraph form or qualitative. And then you have uh, seven three seven point short answers, which uh, a lot of times are in paragraph format. Now, a lot of people think that the AP Physics 1 test is going to be fairly easy, maybe not, maybe not too bad. But in reality, this is from the 2016 exam, um, a little over 4% got a five on the exam. Now that includes, or that's with only needing 70% on the test to get a five. So you essentially can get a C minus on the five, and, or C minus on the test and still get a five. And only 4.3% got that. Uh, you'll notice only 13.6 got a four, and the rest, well, you don't want to score lower than a four, do you? Even in the AP Physics C test, you can see that they're scoring much higher. And this is because the AP Physics C test, even though it's calc based, is very much plug and jug. You just need to find the equation, the variables, plug in the variables, get your answer and spit it out. You really don't need to know much physics for it. But the AP Physics 1 course requires a lot of physics knowledge and very little calculation. And clear that out here. All right. Now, students even agree the test is difficult. I went online and just uh, found this pretty easily. This person says that the test is ridiculous. Students who can pass the AP Physics C might fail Physics 1. Um, they claim it's poorly written. I disagree with that. I think it's uh, great. Um, a lot of college professors will tell you that the new AP Physics test is great. They started, they changed it in 2015 to the new format um, where it's highly conceptual and everybody in the teaching profession really likes it. Um, the students don't like it as much. So they say the wording on the questions is poor. They use language in a way that would conflict with the same language in other tests. Um, this next person totally agrees with them. The whole year he prepares, the teacher was preparing him for um, 
with questions that involve calculations and actual numbers, and then 75 or 95% of the test was conceptual. Um, and the last person also agrees, says, I maybe touched my calculator once or twice. So you're going to have your calculator. You're going to feel good that your calculator is there. You're not going to use it too much. Same with the equation sheet. You'll only occasionally be asked for numerical calculations, but often you need mathematical reasoning. So you need to take the, the equation and know the relationship between the variables and how to apply that in, uh, for the questions. Now, one of my favorite things and something that we're about to do is a ranking task, and they're becoming a lot more popular on the test. They show up every year. Ranking tasks are becoming more prevalent and they assess semi-quantitative reasoning. So here's the first ranking test. All right, so we have six rods and there's a force applied to each of them. It'll show you, it gives you the mass of each rod and the length of each rod, but you'll notice it's not an individual number. They're all in relation to each other. The goal of this is to rank the magnitude of angular acceleration from greatest to least. And this is where I want you to actually try to do this. So if you're scrambling, get something to write with. Try it for a second. Just give it your best shot. They're a little tricky. All right, when we're thinking about angular acceleration, um, we're, we're looking at two things, torque and, um, and the um, rotational inertia. So the, the moment of inertia for these uh, different bars depends highly on the length. The shortest bar is gonna have the smallest moment of inertia. So that's where you're gonna to wanna to start with first. All of these numbers um, and different things on there may throw you off. The important thing is to look at the shortest bit first, and that should be the easiest to turn uh, and the easiest to gain angular acceleration. So the first or the greatest angular acceleration will be C. And then we can go and compare the ones that are um, two length or two L. So looking at D, A, and E, we gotta see which one of these has the highest angular acceleration. Well, E has a force of three F and A has a force of two F. D also has a force of two F, but notice where D is applied. D is applied right where it is pivoting not at the end of the arm like the other ones. So this actually has zero angular acceleration. That means we got to choose between E and A, and of course you want to go with the one that is the stronger force, which will cause a higher angular acceleration. So E, then A, and we're going to save D for last because it has no angular acceleration. Next is between B and F, and uh, B has 4F, uh, 4 times the force, and F has three times the force, so B and F, like that. All right, and D is last. All right, so this is how these things go. Let's try another one. This might require a little bit of calculation, and I know we won't have time right now to actually do the calculations, um, but I'll walk you through it in a second. So you have, all these systems are standing waves. They're fixed on both ends and under tension. All the strings are identical except for their lengths. And the variables in the situation, this is very important to look at, the variables here, are the lengths, the amplitudes, and the antinodes or number of nodes. 
Okay, so we're gonna, you wanna rank these from greatest to least on the basis of their frequencies. A lot of information here. Um, what you want to immediately go and think about is the simple equation of V equals lambda F or velocity equals the wavelength times the frequency. Okay, well, frequency is what we're looking for. Wavelength, we don't really have. We might have information to get wavelength. And velocity, it didn't give us, but it said the variables are the lengths, the amplitudes, and the number of nodes. It didn't say that the speed was variable or the velocity was variable. Therefore, we can assume that it is constant. So let's manipulate the equation. Uh, the frequency equals the velocity divided by the wavelength. And if we're looking for the greatest frequency, we want the smallest wavelength, right? Okay, so how do we find the wavelength? Well, I actually count them. There's one wavelength, two wavelengths, two and a half there. So for that, in 25 centimeters, we'd have 10 centimeter wavelength. And doing the same for B, C, D, E, and F, and G, we can find all their wavelengths. And then we just got to put them in order, once again, going from the smallest wavelength, which will give us the highest frequency, to the largest wavelength. Now, B is first because it's eight centimeters, and then we have E and A as a tie. You will see this kind of thing on the test where you gotta um, either put an equal sign or rank the uh, put both of these letters right together, A and E, and then D, C. F and G are also the same. All right, last one here. These are Atwood machines. And you'll see masses hanging from both sides. Massless string, of course, that just makes it harder if you throw a mass in. You'll never see a mass of a string on these problems. And a frictionless pulley. Not possible, but good for physics problems. Um, each of, the, uh, each of the masses on the left is bigger than the mass on the right. So they'll accelerate to the left downward and the right upward. You wanna rank these on the greatest to least based on the tension, not the acceleration of this system, but the tension in the string. Oh, I see I already revealed the first one. Well, Okay. Yeah. So this, this part is tricky because uh, initially you might think it's going to be the, the system that has the greatest mass. But F has the greatest mass. It has 12 kilograms total. And it is not the one under the, with the highest tension. The way I like to think of it is that the left side is almost a, a stationary for the purposes of the tension. And then look at the right side and see which has the highest mass, which is pulling down the most on the right. Well, E is pulling down the most on the right. It's got three kilograms. Um, when, and the others only have two or one. So E is definitely gonna be first. Next, we have the ones that are under tension with two kilograms on the right. That's F and C. And here we could go with our intuition. Um, which one is going to be under higher tension? Well, the one that has the bigger mass on the left side. So that would be F. And then we have C. B, A, and D are left. And we just go with the higher mass on the left for those D, B and A. All right, so this is uh, definitely the kind of question you're gonna see in a free response section. Um, 
possibly a multiple choice section. They use them every year. And they also are really good at getting to the, to the concepts of, of this rather than just the calculation. So you will need familiarity with lab work. Uh, you should be taking a physics course right now um, that has lab work involved. And in the, in the exam, you have a question that's open-ended, worth 12 points. Many correct, um, there are many quite correct ways to answer that question. And uh, many students find that to be a very difficult part of the, the test, but actually not as difficult because there's a little bit of leeway, leeway, not as difficult as the other free response questions. So I pulled from the 2016 exam, I pulled a few of the hardest questions, the ones that people had the most trouble with. So let's take a look at this one. All right, two blocks on two different ramps or two different slides that launch horizontally from the top of the lab table. Team one and two assemble the slides shown above and use identical blocks, one and two, respectively. Both start, slides start at the same height, D, above the tabletop. However, team two's table is lower than team one's table. To compensate for the lower table, team two constructs the right end of the slide to rise above the tabletop. All right, so we're talking about this part right here. It rises above the tabletop so that the block leaves the slide horizontally at the same height. All right, so they both leave at the same height and they both have the same distance D that they are dropping down. And what do we need to know? We need to know, uh, well, it says both blocks are released from rest at the top of their respective slides. Do block one and block two land the same distance from their respective tables? So how, how far do they go? Hmm. Do they go the same distance? Well, the answer is, No, they don't go the same distance. Now this is this is pretty easy, yes or no, uh, yes or no answer. But you're not going to get many points if you answer correctly and then don't justify it. So when you justify it, you're going to write a text paragraph that has to hit on, in, in this particular instance, three points. One of them is you want to um, you want to start with the potential energy that that is being used up here. So uh, both of these blocks, because of the distance that they are sitting up there, distance D, both of the blocks start with the same potential energy. So we're seeing if they land the same distance. Um, and they both start the same with potential energy. Block two, though, converts some of its kinetic energy at the bottom. back into potential energy because of that little rise there. So they both fall the same amount and they both gain the same amount of uh, kinetic energy, lose the same amount of potential energy until that little part where it goes up in block two is losing some of that kinetic energy and putting it back into potential energy. So block two converts some of its kinetic energy at the bottom back into kinetic oops, potential energy. So what happens there? When that happens, block two slows down. And 
leaves the table with less velocity than block one. All right, so it leaves with less to block one. Now, one of the really important things we got to look at is how high these tables are from the ground because how high they are from the ground um, dictates how long it takes for the block to reach the ground once it leaves the table. They're both at H, so they're both at the same height. That means they take the same amount of time before they hit the ground. So if they take the same amount of time before they hit the ground, then what's gonna determine whether they travel further or not? Well, it's the velocity which with, with which they leave the table. Which one goes faster? Block one goes faster. So since they are both the same height from the ground, they are in the air the same amount of time. Block one will travel further in that time because it left with a higher velocity. All right, notice I didn't use many fancy words or anything in here, um, but I did address the physics concepts that are going on in the problem. Readers are not impressed with big words. They know big words too. They want to know that you understand the physics behind this. All right. So usually I'd be um, asking students, you know, a little back and forth about what's going on, if they're understanding, if I'm going too slow, going too fast. Um, I got nothing here, so I'm just, I'm just going, all right? Here's another one. Teams one and two use the tables in low friction slides with the same height. However, the two slides have different shapes. All right, we can see the shapes. Um, this one, I don't even know what that's for. Let me erase that. Um, this one is, steeper at first, and this one is shallower at first, block two. Both our blocks are released from rest at the top of their respective slides. Excuse me. Which block, if either, lands farther from its respective table? Okay, well, if they're both at the same height, then we know that the time in the air is the same, just like in the last problem. So, um, the distance that they land from the table depends on how fast they're going at the end of this slide, just like in the last problem. Well, if we go back to the potential energy, then we know that they're still at the same height. They're both losing that same amount of potential energy and converting it into kinetic energy. So at the bottom of the slide, they should both be going the same velocity. That means that they should land with the same, at the same distance here. So we would check this one, land at the same distance. All right. Now we're gonna explain why, well, oops, I just basically said it there. I don't know what's going on here, text, there. All right, lost it. All right, bear with me while I get my text box going here. All right, so um, they both convert the same amount of potential energy into kinetic energy. So
so that they are both leaving the table with the same velocity. Since they are both the same height from the ground, they should both land the same distance away. All right, so that should take care of that one. Now, which block, if either, hits the floor first? Seems like, uh, seems like maybe that should be the same too, but it's not, it's not. They are both going the same velocity when they leave the table and they're both traveling in the air the same amount, but block one is getting to the end of the table first because of this steep incline. It is accelerating faster at first and slower at the end of its ramp and block two is doing the opposite, just accelerating slowly and then faster at the end. So, so block one actually gets to the bottom of the ramp quicker. That means it leaves the table quicker. That means it hits the ground first. So block one. All right. Um, and I won't make you sit through uh, me typing out what I just said, which is, which is exactly what you would write down. All right, we got one more. You'll always see, sorry. You will always see um, either a wave problem or electricity free response problem, possibly both. So let's look at this. Figure on the left shows a uniformly thick rope hanging vertically from an oscillator that is turned off. When the oscillator is on and set at a certain frequency, the rope forms the standing wave shown above on the right. P and Q are two points on the rope. All right, it says the tension on point P is greater than the tension on point Q. So P's got greater tension here than Q does. Hmm, okay. Briefly explain why. Well, why does it have greater tension up there? The hint is in the setup. It is set up vertically. And if we're looking at this rope, there is a lot more weight below P than there is below Q. So a lot more of the rope is supported by point uh, P. All right, so we would put that in there. Let's see, one of the more weight. Oh, I'm writing in red, that's cool. I don't like writing in red though. More weight is supported by point P then point Q causing a higher tension. And we might say, well, they might want even a little bit more that like, why does that cause a higher tension? Because of the Earth's gravitational pull on the rope. All right, so basically you're saying it's gravity. Um, a student hypothesizing that increasing the tension in a rope increases the speed at which the wave travels along the rope. In a clear, coherent paragraph length response that may also contain figures and or equations, explain why the standing wave shown above supports the student's hypothesis. All right, well, let's see. Um, increasing the tension in the rope. It, it already told us that point P has a higher tension than point Q. And if you look at the waveform on this, 
you'll notice that point P has a longer wavelength than point Q. So if you, that means that the high, under higher tension, there was a higher wavelength. So if he's hypothesizing that increasing the tension in the rope increases the speed at which the waves travel, then, well, we got to do a little, we'll figure it out here. So let's see. Um, let's say, let's state that from the experiment. We can observe the wavelength of the higher tension part of the rope is longer. Okay, that's what we just said. Um, and then since the oscillator is set at a fixed frequency. So it's shaking it at a fixed frequency, a certain frequency. We're not changing the frequency, we're just changing the tension. We can go back and use our, uh, just that standard uh, wave equation. We know from the equation this is where you're going to use the equation. V equals, you know, just write out lambda because I don't have that available to, uh, to just type in there. We know from that equation, V equals lambda F, that if lambda goes up, so the wavelength goes up, So does V, right? So what we're saying is that um, F is, frequency is uh, constant, lambda goes up, V must also go up too. All right. So, AP Physics 1, even though the most students who take an advanced physics course in high school take AP Physics 1, it is the most difficult test um, for physics and probably one of the most difficult AP tests, period. Um, you will not pass with just plugging and chugging. You got to write a lot in the free response section and you can't just, just, uh, <laughs> baloney your way through it, I'm gonna say. So you need to know physics, which means you need to practice physics. And we're gonna have a class where um, I invite you to join and we will practice physics together. Here's my last question. What is wrong with this picture? Where should, where should the student uh, stand? Definitely not in the way of that uh, bowling ball, right? 